<clears throat> we ready to go? Ready to go, Mark? Yes, sir. Sir. Yeah, we've had uh, three really good practices. The guys are uh, not happy with, with last week, obviously, and uh, they've come back to work. You never know um, with a team and a lot of uh, young ones on this team how they're going to respond. And uh, to start looking at uh, this weekend, it should be fun. It's the first time some of these guys really, uh, two classes have seen a, a full house. So uh, Keenan will be full and rocking on Saturday night. and That'll be fun. Uh, it's a, a wonderful time to appreciate and say thank you to the first responders uh, and honor them. I was a guy, like I said the other day, that uh, I remember 9-11 vividly. Uh, it's part of my life. Uh, it will be forever, obviously, and it's, it's something that uh, uh, all younger people need to go back and revisit and look at because there were some real heroes that day, that uh, some that lost their lives and, and some that didn't. Uh, but I, I remember it like it was yesterday. Uh, so uh, honoring um, the head of emergency services, Kirby Saunders, who actually went to New York and, and um, fell in love with, with uh, being a first responder uh, at 9-11. Uh, so he will be um, honored on, on Saturday night as well. Uh, but all the tickets are sold, so that, that should be fun. Uh, it should help our team uh, get back on their feet. Uh, also, a young guy that had a wreck last year, Lee Fitch, uh, we're, we're honoring him because he's, uh, uh, he, he's a local young man that uh, uh, was struggling uh, when he first got hit by a car. Um, and he was on his skateboard. And at that time I went to him and said, I'll make sure that you're at that first game. Uh, and we, we won't honor him publicly, but we will, um, we will give him a special night because he's come so far uh, since he was laying in that bed and, and we weren't sure about his future. So I'm really, really happy for him. Um, you can learn a lot from losing. You'd rather not. The best thing that could have happened to us was go in that environment, um, get in trouble like we did and then come back and win at the end. And, and we weren't able to do that. So that was the disappointing part. The, the good thing is they saw we could have. And, and um, uh, we felt like we should have. We had our opportunities to finish and, and, and we just didn't finish it offensively. Defensively, we had the slow start again, but we, we got much better. So now we've got to build on that. To be the defense we want to be, uh, we, we've got to start being a, a great defense, especially on, on first downs. Uh, so we can put people in second and third and long. A uh, kicking game I'm encouraged with. I think it's, it's there. We've just got to do it. And when it starts happening, they'll, they'll continue to, to improve. Offensively, we've got to pick it up. We've got to do better. We've been uh, running up and down the field here for two years, and that didn't happen on, on Saturday night. And a lot of the mistakes that are made were ours. Uh, we said too much penetration, um, too many sacks too much disruption. Usually a sack keeps you from having a drive. We had six of them. Uh, so uh, we had some big plays, but we didn't consistently move the ball and have a rhythm. And that's something that's got to happen um, on Saturday night. So uh, we know the concerns. We got to fix them. It's easier to fix them after a game than it is against yourself. You talk about them, you try to do it. And, and um, we didn't get some of those things done like we had hoped to do. Uh, and then you move forward to the next week. We're, um, we're lucky that we're paying uh, a good uh, group of five opponent. Uh, Sean Elliott's, uh, uh, he's an outstanding coach. He's been at Division One a long time. He was the interim coach at South Carolina a few years ago. Uh, he's been to three bowls in the last four years. He's done a tremendous job at that program. Army is an absolute awful opener. You, you don't want to spend all your time working on the option. Um, I've been told they've been working on us for, for three weeks instead of Army. Um, and, and like us, they left disappointed. So they'll come in here with, uh, with a great attitude. But instead of having some uh, group of five or FCS team that's not any good at all, we need a good opponent. We, we need to get better because we, we've got uh, then Virginia coming in the next week. So uh, we've got a lot of things we've got to fix. And, and again, the better the opponent, uh, the better for us. And uh, it will be Sunbelt officials. You usually uh, have the away league officials come to your place, and then next year when we play them, uh, it will be um, ACC officials. Uh, they did beat Tennessee a couple of years ago. Ty Chandler addressed the team with, with uh, uh, that nugget today after practice, and um, 
he said that uh, uh, they're definitely capable. So we, we need to be ready to play. So we've asked them, obviously you take care of your, your faith, your family and your academics. And the next most important thing is your, your football for Saturday night. So uh, get rested from this point. It, it's pretty much a review tomorrow at practice and uh, but get yourself ready to go. Questions? All right, our first oh, question our first this morning questions. will come from C.L. Brown. Hi, Mac. This is unrelated to the game, but kind of a bigger, bigger picture question of, of football and college athletics. I was curious in what ways do you feel like COVID has changed college sports. And, uh, can you hear me all right? Okay. Yeah, you were going I, in, in what that. ways has COVID? Okay. <laughs> in what ways has COVID changed college sports uh, forever here going forward? See, Al, I think COVID's changed our lives forever going forward. Uh, this time last year, we really didn't know what was going on. Again, we, we didn't even know if we were going to play. And we didn't know if touching the ball or touching a, a box outside that was delivered to your house or where you had to take your clothes off when you came in and, and wash them or take your shoes off or um, could you pass it by touching something with your, with your hand or, um, and then we got the six feet apart and then we didn't know if a football would, would spread it. Uh, we didn't know how offensive and defensive linemen would have an inside drill or, or we didn't know whether um, uh, a game could be played or what you have to do on the sideline and do you stand with your mask? So we know so much more about, COVID for football now, but we also know much more about COVID for our lives. I saw last night, 75% of Americans have at least one shot of the vaccine. I see full crowds in, in, um, in stadiums and I'm not hearing of reports of a, a lot of sickness. So uh, it seems to me like what we're doing is we're learning how to live uh, a life uh, with COVID uh, we're learning how to play football with COVID, and that seems like it's going to be around. Uh, so this is something that we're going to have to continue to do. All right, thanks. Thank you. Andrew Jones, go ahead. Hey, Coach, when you're looking at Georgia State's film on defense from just this past weekend, how challenging is it to get a lot from it, considering the fact that they went up against the unique uh, approach that Army uses offensively? Yeah, Andrew, it's a, it's a really good question. You, we, we go back, we look at the personnel in that game, but we go back to their last three games from last year. They were really good at the end of last year, and it's the same people. I think they've got about 15 seniors starting, and a lot of their super seniors came back, I think. So uh, we're, we're looking at who they were last year. They were good, and when you're good, you keep doing what you were doing. Uh, and they're, they're very sound. They've, they've got good players. Their secondary is good. Um, their linebackers are a little bit more inexperienced, but their, their front sound. They, they played too deep the other day. Uh, so Sean's done a good job. He's, he's got good players. Cornelius Brown, the big quarterback, uh, last year ran up and down the field. Uh, he didn't have his best game the other day, so I'm sure he'll be like us offensively. He's, he's, they're trying to get back on track. And they run an offense about like ours. So, so that part of it, uh, defensively, it, it shouldn't be that hard to adjust to what they're doing. Uh, offensively, we've just gone back to the last three games of last year uh, that they won and that they played really well with the same players and looked at what they were doing against similar offenses that, uh, like ours. I also saw on Twitter a little while ago that uh, Lawrence Taylor tweeted out that he's coming back this weekend. Uh, can you kind of take us through your role in him coming back and what you might have him do around the team or say to the team? Or Because he was on the last ACC champion at Carolina. Yes, we, we tried uh, hard a couple of years ago to get him back from Miami, and it didn't work. And then last year with COVID, there, there wasn't much inviting anybody back. Uh, I, I just was told that this morning. So I'm so excited that Lawrence is coming back. He's not only – I told the kids uh, yesterday – um, or this morning at, at the 6.30 meeting when I heard he was coming back, that uh, he's not only one of the greatest players to ever play here, he's one of the greatest players to ever play. So I, I, I'm, I'm going to check his schedule today and see if what time he gets in and uh, see if, if he can come and, and meet the kids, and, and I think that'd be great. And, and also the fact that uh, Taman Fox just broke his, his sack record 
um, just went ahead of him to, to be the fifth all time is, is really cool too. But I'm going to show a video of, of Lawrence to our team in the morning because a lot of those guys haven't seen him play. And, and I want them to see um, what, what they're going to meet when he, when he gets here. Good stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Mike Salarte, go ahead. Thanks very much. Good morning, Coach. Uh, Mike Salarte, Spectrum News One. You touched on uh, what Georgia State you know, likes to do based on uh, their seniors coming back. But coming off of the loss, and you said that the practices the last couple of days have been really good, do you, is there a concern as a coach that guys may want to try to do too much because of that loss? So they may be a little bit more fired up to, you know, all right, that's not going to happen again. So let's go ahead and take care of business and, and, and try to be, uh, you know, try to be the hero on, on play as opposed to just doing their job. Yeah, absolutely, Mike. I, I also talked to them this morning about uh, the expectations and the pressure that, that uh, we have put on the program. Um, probably moving faster than, than we were ready to move. And we talked about in preseason, the, half of this team's really, really young or more than half. And, and then you've got some older guys that were probably ready for this, but the younger guys aren't there yet. So we should be a team that improves every week, number one. Uh, secondly, I told them today in a weird way, pressure's off. Uh, I mean, you, you, we didn't respond to number five very well last year. We didn't respond to number 10 very well last week. So uh, we're still in the top 25, uh, and, and that would have been super two years ago. But go back to work. Go back and have fun. We, we didn't look like we had enough fun on offense on, on Friday night. We need to go back and, and, and enjoy this game, enjoy who we are. We're going to be a great program. Uh, we're still killing it in recruiting. Things are so positive moving forward. Um, but go play. Go enjoy yourself. And and uh, let's stir this crowd up and, and show the, the crowd what we've got coming. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Michael Coe, go ahead. Hey, Coach, what are some of the challenges of preparing for a team like Georgia State that UNC has never played before, as opposed to preparing for someone like Virginia Tech that you play every year? Michael, everybody does pretty much the same stuff with a few wrinkles. So what you do, you put your, your schemes in, and they, they work against everything. And then you take pieces of it each week to, to adjust to the team that you're playing. So I really don't think that the, the fact that we haven't played them will mean that much. And uh, like I said, they're, they're talented, they're older. Uh, some of our guys from Atlanta know their guys, so they know that they're fired up and expecting to come in here and, and have a chance to win, which is good for them. Um, a lot of the guys don't get to play in these environments very often where it's a full house. Uh, so they, they get really, really excited. Uh, and um, so we're, we're expecting uh, a, a great effort uh, out of them. And our, our coaches know um, Coach Elliott very well. Um, Jay played or worked against him uh, when they were younger coaches and then uh, Stacy Searles and Lonnie Galloway know Sean really well from the Appalachian days. So um, the, they, they're already picking at each other. And um, I think the last time they played, South Carolina beat Georgia when Stacy was there and, and Sean was at uh, um, South Carolina. So they're, they're picking at each other all week. So uh, I think both teams will be ready to play and it should be fun. Thank you. Thank you. Greg Barnes, go ahead. Hey, Mac, it sounded like there was some frustration with the, the lack of a review of that first interception in the second half with Justin Olsen. Um, so I'm, I'm curious as to your thoughts on the, the instant replay process as it stands right now, and what, if any, improvements you think should be made? Greg, uh, first answer is yes, uh, without question, 100%, 100%. And I can't talk about it specifically, or I won't be coaching Saturday night, but 100%, uh, and a huge play in the game. Uh, secondly, I, I think there's too much credence put on what the official calls on the field. If he's wrong, it shouldn't matter what he calls. And we sit there and say, we're sticking with the call on the field because we don't see enough. Well, we, if we see enough, they're still, they're not gonna overturn that unless it's really, really obvious. To me, if we're gonna have replay, have it and let the replay, replay official make that decision. And I, I saw a game um, 
I think it was Florida State, Notre Dame, where uh, there was a, a fumble and the other team picked it up and ran it back for a touchdown. It was obviously a forward pass, but the official let it go because they've been told, let it go. It's uh, You don't want to stop a touchdown uh, and we can easily review it and bring it back. But you can't add a touchdown if you blow the whistle dead. Uh, so let it play out. And, and that's what I think we need to be doing more than we are. Let, if, you, if you've got a review, let the review guy be the sole decision maker because he has slow motion. He's got all the pictures. He's got everything. Uh, but they're very, very hesitant to, to overturn something that the official has called on the field. And I think that hurts the, uh, the replay process. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, over to Rithvik. Go ahead. Hey, Coach. Um, so with Sam Howell and other college players signing NIL deals recently, I just wanted to get your thoughts on how the college football landscape has changed from your perspective with NIL. Yeah, Rydvik, it, it's, it's changing as we speak. It's, uh, it's interesting. I, I said earlier when this happened that I, I was the amateurism guy. Let's keep college football separate from the NFL. And then my wife, Sally, said, well, an artist in college can get paid for their art. A musician can go to a, a concert or bar and play and get paid. And that, that seemed fair to me. The thing I, I think that is, is, hasn't been handled as well is there were no guidelines. And, and right now we're still working on guidelines. So you, I'm, I'm reading and learning that Brigham Young gets walk-on scholarships paid for. Well, that opens up a, a new can of worm for everybody if that's legal. Uh, and it seems like it is because we've never been told it's not. Then I hear that a, another school gets five lease cars for players. Um, so our players come to us and say, what about lease cars? What, what does that mean? And which five get them? And so I, I think more than anything else that uh, um, this thing will level out over time and, and we will have a, a better um, – structure of guidelines from the NFL, I mean, from the NCAA over time. And then we will know exactly what, um, what is, is legal and what's not, because it seems like right now just about anything's legal. Where it gets even more gray is with recruits, because they, they, have, they have said specifically that you can't pay Sam Howell per play. And that means you can't pay him for the number of touchdowns he throws. You can't pay Josh Downs for the number of catches he gets. So that, that helps us. Uh, but he can be rewarded uh, that he is a, a player and a significant player um, by whatever group that deems they want to give him an opportunity. Uh, the recruit, it says you can't give them opportunities because they're a recruit. That gets real great. So I, I think everybody's still trying to figure out exactly what all this means. And at some point, I think we'll, we'll settle on more guidelines and then coaches will be much more comfortable. Right now, we're all staying out of it and, um, and allowing the athletics departments to try to, to see what group licensing means so it'll help your entire team. And then the individual player um, is, is responsible for his own opportunities. So we stay out of that. He, he gets them. He has to go through a process called Compass that, that – is linked to our compliance to make sure that uh, he doesn't uh, cross lines with our licensing uh, to make sure that it's legal by the NCAA rules and make sure it's good for him and that the, if the, the contract is written so it's, it's fair for him to do well. Okay, thank you so much, Coach. Thank you. Aaron Beard. Hey, Mac, I wanted to ask something that's sort of along the lines of what Mike Slarte asked about reaction of the team. If, if you have a, a team maybe that isn't very confident, like your first team, the first game might have been a huge setback. I'm sure this group is full of confidence, but is there a way to describe what their, re, what their reaction was? Was it shock? Was it eyes open, attention more dialed in because of what happened? How would you describe that part of it? I think it was more uh, disappointment. Uh, than anything else. Um, they thought we would win. I thought we would win. Uh, we got in a fight. We settled things down. We came back uh, on the road, which is hard to do. And then we all thought we were going to win. And then with 37 seconds left, we didn't. So 
uh, you're mad, you're frustrated, you're disappointed. And then it's, it's our responsibility as coaches to separate all that for them because it, it's about seven, eight plays a game that makes a difference in a ball game and you play for three hours and a half. So uh, the biggest thing, Aaron, is when you get them back on Sunday, you say, here's what was done well, um, here's what needs to improve, and here's why we got beat. And then you start over. And uh, players respond to that much better than coaches. It's, it's been a hard week for, for us as coaches because we're, we're looking at every detail. And um, I'm, I'm usually, if, if a better team beats us, that, that's fine. And Virginia Tech's got a good team. Uh, but I felt like we had opportunities during the game that we didn't take advantage of uh, or we made mistakes in and, and um, not, not talking badly about our coaches. But there were things that, that uh, in retrospect, we should have done better. And, and we, we didn't, and, and that's the disappointing thing for a loss like this. So uh, coaches have a harder time getting, getting over this than, than players. Players go back to work, they go back to class, they go back to their girlfriends, they go back to their families. Coaches have to live with this. And, and we have to live with this for the rest of our lives. You don't, you don't get those back. Thanks. Art Chansky, go ahead. <clears throat> hey, Mac, um, I saw your open practice this morning. And uh, you are CEO and mostly an observer throughout the throughout the practice. Can you talk about how the role of a uh, head coach has changed since you first began in terms of how involved you are during practice and what are the reasons for that? Reasons for that? More coaches, more support people. Uh, can can you walk through that a little bit? Yeah. Art, you've been doing this a long time. There's no way you can walk out there for six periods and decide how I coach. I mean, that'd be a, a very difficult thing to do. No, uh, I was just and, watching. I was just watching. It, that's all. I know for six periods, mm -hmm. right. for 30 minutes. And we've been doing this for 33 years. Mm -hmm. What What is not different. Um, in, in fact, I'm not much different than I was when I started. I scream less. I used to yell all the time and, and it's not as effective when you yell. What I do is I write down every little thing I see at practice. Um, I, I keep a mic on. So if I need to address something during practice, I address it. Uh, but if practice is going well, uh, then it's, it's better for me to stay out of it. And what we've got now that was different from the old days, we've got cameras everywhere. We've got uh, side cameras, front cameras, back cameras, close-ups, wide angle. So I'll walk off this field, and when I get back to the office, I'll study practice video from now till the staff meeting at 3 o'clock, and then I'll go over every competitive play uh, with our staff every day. So um, the, the other thing that's happened differently than the old days, Art, is because you go so fast with tempo offenses, you never want to stop practice. You, you never want to stop the entire practice for one player. So you take the player out subtly and you, you coach him on the side, but the plays keep going because you've got a script and we've got a class at 11 o'clock. Uh, so we, we have to stay on that script and we have to go fast. So all those things have changed from, from the old days. Um, and, and I think that the, the other part of that is that uh, uh, unless the head coach is the defensive play caller or the offensive play caller, what he does is he, he works on details and he coaches the coaches more than he coaches the players. Now, uh, if a player is loafing, uh, I get him out. Uh, I'm not going to coach a player that's loafing. They, they don't deserve to be out there. In the old days, I would have yelled at him. I, I just get him out and we show it on, on film. We show it on the video so they can do that. But um, more than anything else, uh, I want the practice to be run efficiently. Uh, everybody sprints every play during practice. We don't sprint after practice because they have to sprint. They have to run from drill to drill. Um, it is ultra organized. You've got uh, scripts on everything that you do. Um, so practice is much different than it was 20 years ago. And, and uh, that's why things are going faster and and you see fewer people stopping and screaming and throwing hats and, and, and doing the things that we used to do. And we're trying to be more efficient. We just, we're out there for an hour and a half. Um, so we're, we're trying to get things done and get those guys off the field.
uh, one follow-up. When, when did you, was it that, that the afternoon practices were replaced by morning classes? And I mean, morning practice. And is that, yes. com is that common in college football? Uh, more people are starting to do it for, for lots of reasons. It was done here with Coach Fedora uh, right before he left. He had plans in the spring uh, that I got here to have morning practice. So the academic schedule was already set. I had never done it. Um, I didn't like it. I wasn't going to try it. And it's one of the best things we've ever done for the players uh, and the coaches. Coaches get to go home for dinner with their, their families because we're over here at 530 in the morning. Um, the, the players have a, a life as a student. Uh, they get to be free after their 10 o'clock uh, practice 10, 15 practice, whatever it is, uh, for the rest of the day. Sometimes they come back and lift weights with a schedule. <coughs> Excuse me. Sometimes they'll come back and watch video on their own. Uh, but they can have study hall in the afternoons and art the again, the quote old days. And that was probably five years ago, seven years ago. Uh, you would wait till, um, two 30 to get taped. And then you'd go to your meetings at 3.30. You'd be on the field from 4 to 6. You would go eat. And then you would go to study hall from um, 8 to 10. Um, and you'd be worn out. Uh, it's not uh, um, a conducive environment to study after you're totally exhausted that night. And then you get up at 6, 7 in the morning and, and go to that 8 o'clock class. So it just beats you down over time. This is so much better schedule for these kids. Plus, they, they have to go to bed at 9.30 or 10 because they've got to get up at, at 5. Um, same with me. I've been a night owl my whole life. I'm, I'm in bed by 10 now and up at 5, and that's just the, the way it is. And try to get those seven hours and uh, do that if, if possible. But I, I have asked the players two or three different times, do you like this? Do you want to go back? And they're 100% that they like this and they want to continue doing it. Uh, the, the other part of it that, that I didn't like is that we didn't play well uh, last year uh, at night for the first time um, when we went to Florida State. And then we didn't play as well at Virginia. And those were both night games. And I thought, you know, you practice every morning and it, it sounds like an excuse. But what I'm responsible for is to figure out, is it real and does it happen? So we practiced last week at night, uh, last Sunday night. Uh, we talk to the kids every day about uh, being aware that your pregame meal is at two for the Virginia Tech game. You're, you're going to arrive at the stadium at four. Uh, you're going to have an hour ride. So from three to four, figure out what you're going to do uh, to have your mind right. You're going to arrive at that uh, um, stadium at, at uh, four. You're going to go on the field at five and you're going to kick it off at six. So uh, have that mental clock in, in your mind. And, and I did not, excuse me, I did not think our, our players didn't play hard or, or well the other night. I thought they tried. We made some mistakes, but none of those were because of early morning practice or being complacent or not being locked in uh, because they played so hard that second half. Thank you. Great stuff. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, last question today will come from Davis Wallace. Hey, Coach, uh, I know you're not a fan of the preseason rankings and that you would prefer to wait until the college football playoff rankings. I was just wondering, earlier in the season, how would you determine quality wins if there weren't any preseason rankings to help teams like Carolina move up in the college football rankings? Yeah, I would think, Davis, that you would just follow those through the, the, the season. And, and obviously Virginia Tech was a quality win over us because we were supposed to be a good team. But, but when you start getting credit for beating a top 10 team when we weren't, because we didn't play like we were, and there were eight other universities that got credit for beating top 25 teams, and they probably weren't, uh, when you start looking at it, I just don't think we should um, rank the teams until midseason. And then you go back and, and can say, um, if, if, if we come back and we start playing really well, uh, and you're in October and those college football playoff rankings come out, you can say, boy, that, that win for Virginia tech over Carolina was really a quality win. You got to give those guys a lot of credit because Carolina was really a good team and they beat them on that first night. And, and that's what I would do where, um, 
I've always, I've often thought when I was in the media, if, if they fired you guys or docked your pay for every bad team that you put in the top 10 or the top 20, you'd probably move those till mid season. Um, so, uh, none of you are showing your polls this week. <laughs> and I think that that's just part of the deal. We don't know. And we're acting like we do. We don't, we have no idea. Coaches don't even know how good your team is till you start. You think you do. And that's one of the reasons we, we excite all the fans and then let them down if we're not as good as expectations. And, and um, I, I just think that could be done better for, for the kids. All right. Thank you, coach. Thank you, Davis. All right, coach. We're, uh, we're all done now at this point. Thanks uh, for a few minutes this morning. Thank you. Everybody stay safe and we'll see you Saturday. It'll be fun to, to have a full house again in Kenan. Will you all be there? Thumbs up if you're coming. Will you? Yeah, we'll be there. Some of us. About half. Jeremy yeah, we got said. about half. We'll have about a half full crowd in the uh, press box, Coach. Good. Okay. And That's then afterwards, more. we're back to Zoom. So we'll be doing the same press conference that we, we've been doing. Okay. Sounds great. Have a great week.